Thank you, thank you very much. So I would like to address the question of uh, stellar explosions and uh, there's a connection to the question of gravitational waves because as we're going to see, uh, although stars are roughly spherical, they explode in a <coughs> sideways manner they, uh, and having this uh, aspherical or asymmetrical type of explosion, they are an interesting source of gravitational waves. <clears throat> I'm going to talk about uh, massive stars. So uh, those explosions are the, uh, the outcome or can be the outcome of the life of a massive star. And we know that we need massive stars to uh, make the black holes which have been detected, uh, which uh, coalescence has been detected. So, those um, stellar explosions are possibly uh, a promising source of uh, gravitational waves which haven't been detected yet. So far we have just de detected the, the coalescence of black holes, but we hope in the future to, to be able to, to detect such, uh, such uh, explosions. So the, the picture here is the, the milestone supernova which exploded in 1987. So it's a milestone because it exploded at a time in 87 when we had on Earth uh, powerful enough or sensitive enough detectors of neutrinos and uh, those such explosions uh, produce uh, neutrinos which, which have been detected uh, at that time and it was the first time and, and the last time. Although such uh, supernova explosions take place every night uh, in distant galaxies, those are too far to be able to, to detect such neutrinos. So our, we are very impatient to having a, such uh, an explosion in our galaxy to, to be able to detect uh, again uh, neutrinos in more detail because now our detectors are more advanced. And the, the very exciting um, uh, uh, perspective would be to, to detect it uh, to be able to detect it with gravitational waves because having neutrino and gravitational waves is really uh, a source of direct information from the very inner part of the star at the moment when it explodes. <coughs> so um, I would like to, to say right from the beginning that understanding uh, such explosions is, has been a challenge for many years, for uh, 50 years. And uh, this, this event was really the beginning of a, a robust theory of stellar explosion, but it's not clear whether we can, we can call this theory robust uh, yet, uh, because the, uh, our theoretical understanding leads to uh, explosions with numerical simulations, which are maybe uh, a bit weakish compared to what is observed every night. So, uh, we, can, we can have a positive, uh, an optimistic view on the state of theory of such explosions, and that's my view, but uh, of course there are many criticisms that can be uh, raised. And so one, it's not only that we detected neutrinos for this uh, particular supernova, but we also were able to identify the progenitor of the explosion, so by looking at uh, photographic plates uh, uh, before the date of the explosion, uh, the, the, the origin of this explosion was confirmed as the, the death of a massive star, which was a very uh, important milestone to, to, to build a, th a theory. And so for this uh, difficult problem for uh, theoretical astrophysics, I, I'm going to present a, a surprisingly simple fountain just based on the flow of water uh, uh, along a, a uh, hyperbolic surface, which is going to, to teach us about the, um, the hydrodynamical instabilities which uh, are responsible for uh, asymmetric explosions. So I don't want to disappoint you uh, with this fountain. So I, I don't want you to imagine that this fountain is going to explode in some, in some, <laughs> some way. So I'm, I'm going to show you from the beginning what you're going to see in this fountain and, and little by little we'll, we will see uh, how interesting it is for astrophysics. So it's a fountain where you see this kind of uh, rotating wave. You will see more details uh, in a minute. But it's a fountain where you inject water from the outside towards the center. So that here you have a very thin slit uh, of a half a millimeter 
where water is injected along this surface and you produce, so there's a thin layer of water here which is uh, uh, difficult to, to see, and then uh, when the water meets this obstacle in the middle, this kind of uh, vertical cylinder, it produces uh, a shock, I mean the equivalent of a shock, which is called the hydraulic jump. And I, I will go into detail of this uh, later on, but the, instead of having a, a perfectly circular hydraulic jump, which would, have been, which would have been expected since we inject water in a very stationary and uh, axisymmetric manner, we see that some uh, surprising dynamics takes place. And this is really uh, from this type of dynamics that we are going to infer some interesting uh, properties of stellar explosion. So it's quite, uh, I mean, it's not an explosion itself. This is uh, going to describe the moment when the star um, collapses, bounces, I mean, the, the core of a star collapses uh, to form a very dense object which we have heard of before, which is called a neutron star. So the core of a star is going to collapse to form a neutron star, and the matter is going to flow uh, in free fall, it's going to fall on this uh, very dense uh, center, and the, this flow of water is going to mimic the infall of, of uh, the stellar core towards the center, and this uh, cylinder in the middle is going to mimic the surface of the proto-neutron star. So this is the, the surface on which matter is, is crashing, and producing a, a shock wave. So we are going to look at a very uh, small region of space at the center of a star. This region is going to be like uh, 300 kilometers in uh, diameter out of, uh, I mean, inside a star which is several hundred million uh, kilometers in a radius. So we are going to look at the very, very small region, uh, very small inner region, but which, which is the most interesting because it's the decisive moment for the success or the failure of the explosion and for the properties of this object in the middle, which is the, the neutron star. So the, the question that we are going to be able to address with this experiment can be summarized in this uh, list of three. So this, this experiment should help us understand why a spherical uh, star should explode sideways it should ex help explain why uh, a neutron star at birth uh, is so fast, because this is an important property of, of neutron stars, is the fact that they are, uh, here is an example, um, it's the guitar nebula, where here you have a neutron star moving at, um, at uh, more than 1,000 kilometers per second, so we will uh, address this later. And, um, and also, uh, what, what is responsible for the neutron star spin? Is it possible that a neutron star could rotate in a different direction than the rotation of the star from which it's, it's born? So these are uh, very exciting questions for astrophysics, especially given the simplicity of the fountain. And, but uh, on the other hand, the simplicity of, of, of uh, water motion in this fountain uh, will be uh, analyzed, I mean the motion will be analyzed using very simple physical arguments that I guess you teach to your students, such that the question of uh, uh, scales in physics, I mean equations can describe things on big and small scale, the fountain is one million times smaller than the core of the star uh, that it describes and the equations are still similar. Uh, you, you have uh, interesting analogies between, as I said, shock waves and uh, hydraulic jumps. You have very simple uh, uh, energy arguments between potential kinetic energy and also thermal energy. And uh, for these questions of uh, the speed of neutron star and, and, uh, and the spin of neutron stars, you have very simple uh, uh, arguments of conservation of uh, linear momentum and angular momentum. The question of instability is probably the most advanced part of this, uh, of this list. But if you, if you think of instabilities as simply the, the way that this stick cannot stand uh, uh, on its own and starts to fall, you, uh, in, a, in a sense, you're going to see with this, uh, with this kind of uh, fountain that the the breaking of the spherical symmetry of, uh, of, of, the, of the star is 
apparently a natural outcome of this uh, simple experimental uh, setup. And, uh, and if you think of, for example, if you think of a, a flag in the wind, um, you are just used to see flapping flags in the wind. It's not so easy for you or for me to explain why a flag should flap because we could uh, accept the fact that a, a regular wind would maintain the flag ex exactly uh, along the wind. But there is some uh, instability which we don't understand immediately. But we, we, are, we are used to see that so many times that we accept it. And in a sense, this fountain would uh, should uh, um, make us use to accept the idea that the star should not explode in a spherical manner. Can I just ask one thing? Um, you had uh, some kind of detector or weather vane hanging above the cylinder in that video. Oh, oh yes, yeah, sorry, I didn't say. Yes, I didn't say Can that you repeat the question? Yes, the, there is this metal bar. The question is about this metal bar here which I will comment on later. This is just a passive piece of metal which, which um, touches the, the water, does not influence it, just to, to, to show the, the angular velocity in the inner regions and compare it to the, to the outer regions. But we will go back to this uh, later. So please feel free to interrupt uh, any time because uh, this is meant to be really accessible. So. Uh, now, I mean, I, I will try to make sense of, of this astrophysical sense of this fountain, but I, still we need to, to have a few uh, uh, numbers in mind, or in scales at least in mind. And at, there is this, uh, this graph of time scales and uh, length scales, which tries to summarize the diversity or the very wide range of uh, length scale and, and time scales, uh, which, uh, f which you have to deal with when you study the death of, of massive stars. So, uh, so I, have just, I, I just put po points in this diagram to, to show the typical size and time scale of, of several um, uh, steps in the life of a star. So, for example, I, I put this point here to, to, uh, uh, on a time scale of uh, 10 million uh, years, uh, which is going to be the duration of, uh, of hydrogen burning at the, at the center of a star. And, uh, and then helium burning, carbon burning, oxygen burning, silicon burning, burning are going to take place on smaller uh, uh, sizes and, um, and also on shorter, shorter and shorter time scales down to uh, uh, the production of an iron core at the center of this massive star. And, uh, and, the, and at the same time as, this, uh, as these uh, regions of burning uh, take place in the, in the core of the star, you have the surface of the star shown by this, uh, this line here, which has inflated at the moment of uh, helium burning. You have now a red supergiant. So remember that each square is a factor 10. So you, it's really a huge scale here that you have uh, on the logarithmic scale. And, and, um, and so what's important to show in this graph is that the region of interest in my talk is here on, at the lower corner where time scales of, of the order of one second and the distance scales of the order of, of, of 100 kilometers are going to be important. But don't, uh, don't uh, forget that between the scale of 100 kilometers and the surface of the, this red supergiant you have uh, seven orders of, or six or seven orders of magnitude. And between the size, uh, so when, when, when the explosion starts in, in this very inner region, uh, it takes some time to, uh, for the shock wave to propagate to the surface, what we call the shock breakout. And then uh, there are, again, um, uh, seven uh, orders of magnitude to reach the size of known uh, supernova remnant that we observe in the galaxy. So there is as much uh, order, as many orders of magnitude inside the star as uh, outside the star, in a sense. So s this gives you an impression of how small this, this region is. And as the shock propagates and produces this uh, uh, supernova remnant, so it's a very important process in astrophysics because it's going to, to um, feed the, the, the galaxy with new elements which have been synthesized in, inside the star. So it's, uh, it's the very important process uh, to, 
to enrich the galaxy with heavy elements. At the same time, the core, which has been uh, which has collapsed to a neutron star, so here on a scale of a few uh, tens of kilometers, this neutron star is going to shrink to uh, uh, a little more than 10 kilometers uh, as, a, as a pulsar, which is going to, a neutron star, a pulsar, which is going to, to stay there for uh, uh, forever if nothing happens to, to it. So this is just a reminder of the different scales. Now, if we talk of those uh, uh, remnants, those uh, famous uh, remnants in our galaxy, it's a good moment maybe to, to uh, make a distinction between two types of supernovae. Although when, when you look at remnants uh, like those, uh, those five at least, uh, it looks like a, a sphere of uh, ejected material which <coughs> emits uh, light in X-rays <coughs> after hundreds of years. So the, we have seen pictures uh, uh, this morning by uh, Lisa showed you the Crab Nebula with the pulsar in, at, the, at the center emitting in X-rays. There is this uh, famous Cassiope A, um, uh, also uh, very well observed, <coughs> and, uh, and uh, 1987A, <coughs> <coughs> which is much more recent, of course, very much smaller. So these three, <coughs> uh, I mean, this one is not strictly, strictly galactic because it's in the uh, Large Magellanic Cloud, but uh, these three prototype of, um, of uh, uh, core collapse uh, supernova are, are, are the most popular, are the most uh, studied. But, and you have very, uh, uh, you have beautiful supernova remnant as the, the Tycho or Kepler or SN1006, which are due to a different type of supernovae, which I'm, I'm sure you've heard of. Those are, are called uh, thermonuclear supernovae. And they, they share some uh, common properties with the death of massive stars, but they are completely different in a sense because they come from the, the collapse of a white dwarf. So the, the iron core, which I've just mentioned uh, in the previous slide, has a structure uh, uh, has, uh, has reached an equilibrium, a balance between uh, gravity and pressure, and uh, it's a quantum uh, uh, pressure due to the degeneracy of uh, electrons, and the same type of equilibrium is reached inside a white dwarf. So a white dwarf is about the size of, of the Earth or the size of I mean, a few thousand kilometers, and, but the mass of the Sun, typically, or fraction of the mass of the Sun, up to a threshold which is about 1.4 solar masses. And this threshold is common in these two types of supernovae, and, and those two uh, types of supernovae are triggered uh, for the same reason when the mass reaches or approaches this threshold. So either the iron core, uh, iron core uh, reaches the mass, uh, this threshold of 1.4 solar masses at the center of a massive star, uh, and starts to collapse because it's, uh, it's the maximum mass which can be supported by this type of pressure. And the same process takes place in, if you have a, a white dwarf made of carbon and, and oxygen, uh, which uh, receives matter from a companion in a binary system, for example. And uh, so the, the starting point is the same, but the, the story is, after that is different because in what we're going to describe with this fountain, this iron core is going to, to collapse and try to bounce uh, and fail to bounce and lead to the instabilities I'm going to describe um, and lead to a neutrino powered explosion in the end. Whereas here, the, the main difference is that you're dealing with an object made of carbon and oxygen which, which still has uh, uh, some binding, some nuclear binding energy to feed uh, the explosion. And so the, this is a thermonuclear explosion because the, the, the fusion of carbon and oxygen into uh, iron uh, is able to, to, to give a huge amount of energy which is able to completely explode this uh, white dwarf and leave n nothing behind. So there is nothing in the middle of, this, uh, of these remnants. Whereas in those remnants, there is a collapsed core of neutrons, which is the, a neutron star, and, uh, and uh, maybe in some cases a black hole if this neutron star uh, collapses. Okay, so this is the, an important distinction. Yes? Just real quick, why is, the why is ejection only up to silver? Why not any heavier elements? 
Okay, so that's a very good question and very difficult one. <laughs> uh, so in the past, people used to think that uh, uh, supernovae would be responsible for all elements up to uh, the heaviest uranium, let's say. And, uh, and so to maybe to answer this question, there is uh, this uh, you need to to have in mind uh, the you need to have in mind the the, how the binding energy uh, is distributed across the elements. And so up iron is this uh, element with the highest binding energy. And, and so making these elements up to iron is a natural thing for a star, if it's massive enough. Whereas making all those elements be, uh, uh, beyond iron uh, is not uh, favored, because all these elements would like to give energy by fission uh, uh, through fission reactions. Uh, to, to produce uh, elements close to iron. And, and so the way to produce those, those elements is uh, through um, uh, explosive uh, uh, reactions, when you have uh, conditions to enrich uh, nuclei uh, with neutrons. So you, if, you're, if you find conditions where you can uh, uh, throw neutrons to, to the nuclei uh, and, uh, and then those neutrons will uh, then uh, produce uh, protons. Then it's a way to go along, along those heavy, uh, heavier elements, but this is an out of equilibrium uh, reaction. And so you need to find conditions in, in nature where you have a strong neutron-rich wind. And, um, and uh, core collapse supernova is such a place where you have potentially a neutron-rich wind, uh, but it's not as rich in neutrons as people thought uh, 10 years ago. The detailed calculations show that actually this wind of neutrons at the, at the moment of the explosion is, uh, is not that rich in, uh, in neutrons. And uh, actually, it's even uh, proton rich in some uh, cases. So the, the f at the moment, the favored place to, to go uh, up to, so uh, silver is here, to go up to uh, uranium is uh, the coalescing of two neutron stars which happens to be uh, uh, the subject of, uh, I mean, the search of uh, gravitational waves from such uh, uh, mergers is, is, uh, is happens to also be uh, the, the favored place for uh, heavy element uh, production. And, and, you, and you can understand that two neutron stars merging, in, indeed, you have plenty of neutrons uh, to, to build uh, heavy elements. So the question then is, are there enough of those neutron star mergers to to be responsible for all the heavy elements that we, we know in, in the galaxy? And the, the answer seems to be yes. But uh, so the short answer is, in the supernova uh, core collapse, there is no, the, 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 the wind of neutrons is not uh, rich enough in neutrons to, to go beyond these uh, points. This is a very, uh, uh, I mean, this is work uh, which such results can may, may change over the last uh, the next uh, five or ten years. Okay, so let me go back to um, let me go back to this point. Uh, <coughs> so now that we have clarified the difference between uh, thermonuclear and core collapse supernovae, I just. Uh, uh, repeat what I said about these properties of neutron stars. So um, neutron stars are incredible objects. I mean, they are at least as interesting as black holes, because not only they, they have uh, extreme uh, uh, gravity and uh, general relativistic effects. I mean, not as large as black holes, but it's, it's, it's uh, an object where you have uh, general relativity, but you have also nuclear physics in a very, uh, uh, very interesting environment. Uh, matter inside a neutron star is, is really, uh, has neutrons really uh, touching each other. There is, there is very little space left inside a neutron star. And, um, and you have uh, also electromagnetism, which, I mean, you, you have all theories of physics merged into an object. You have uh, uh, superfluids, uh, superconductivity. You have all sorts of very complex processes in a, in a neutron star. And one of the special properties of neutron stars is not only that they are very dense and it's the last stage before a black hole, but they are also very fast. 
So here is the velocity, the velocity distribution. Uh, on a log scale here, you have 100 kilometers per second here, 1,000 here. So typically, you have 200 or 300 kilometers per second for those uh, neutron stars. Whereas normal stars from which they are born are typically 10 times slower. So this is a puzzle that you need to understand. And it's actually one of the hints that the, the moment of their birth is, uh, is not spherical and that the, the, the asymmetrical nature, nature of the explosion kicks them out at birth. And uh, one other property of, of pulsars is that there are neutron stars. When we, we say the word pulsar, usually when they, they rotate, and, they, and uh, so they rotate quite fast. So I don't know if all of you are aware that such objects can rotate up to uh, 700, uh, 700 times per second. Uh, I mean, theoretically, they can even rotate up to 900 or 1,000 times per second. Um, and uh, so it's, it's really the breakup velocity where the centrifugal force uh, would uh, balance uh, gravity. So this is, these are incredible numbers when you think that the, the sun rotates in uh, 27 days or the, the yes? Is that translational velocity? Yes. Rotational? So this is translational velocity. The rotational velocity uh, is, uh, uh, I mean, the typical, so when I say 700 times per uh, second, it's the, some extreme pulsars which we believe are accelerated by a companion which uh, provides some angular momentum. But at birth, the, the distribution of uh, rotational periods is, is, about, is flat between 10 uh, milliseconds and 100 milliseconds. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's slower, but still, uh, yep. Uh, how was this data collected? What's the method of estimating so the, yeah, the velocity? So this is a, uh, this is a, so there's a, po a big population of maybe 500 or uh, more pulsars, galactic pulsars, for which you, it's some astrometry. I mean, from, since it's so fast from year to year, to, you can detect the, the displacement. So usually it's a displacement in the plane of the sky. Uh, but I know there may be some other techniques. Maybe Lars could help me on this. When they're out of the plane, they're born in the plane. So if, they're, if you know their age, sometimes you can infer a high velocity from how far it is above the plane. It depends on the different properties. But this is really a reliable, uh, uh, statistically significant. It's a big population and um, with, uh, with reliable measures. Okay, so now that we know about supernova remnant, we know about pulsars, and uh, we need to know a little more about the, uh, the scenario of the explosion. So we have, uh, we have this uh, massive star. I took 15 solar mass as an example, 600 million kilometers, for example, as the outer radius. This, the core of iron is going to reach this threshold of 1.5 or 1.4 solar masses, and uh, beyond this uh, beyond this mass, the pressure forces are not sufficient to resist gravity, and it just takes half a second for this object, which is about the size of the moon, in half a second, it's so massive. I mean, it's uh, more massive than the sun. Uh, it collapses in free fall to form a 50 kilometer. Uh, uh, proton neutron star, and all the gas which was sitting on top of this uh, iron core is uh, falling uh, in free fall and reaches velocities of one tenth of the speed of light. You can compute that simply by measuring the free fall velocity uh, given this mass and this typical distance. So imagine one tenth of the speed of light, you have iron falling. At one tenth of, uh, I mean, falling like it's raining iron at one tenth of the speed of light, and you, <laughs> you're supposed as a theoretician to find the mechanism to convince this uh, rain of iron to change its direction and explode into a supernova. So that's the, the challenge uh, that we face, and so we would like this, uh, this to simply bounce <laughs> and uh, and go back to higher. Uh, altitude, but this doesn't uh, take place like, like that because there is a lot of energy lost in this uh, bounce process. 
uh, there are two very important uh, losses. One is that by reaching such high uh, temperatures, I mean, as iron uh, crashes uh, on the proton neutron star, a lot of kinetic energy is transformed into heat. And heat is so large that it dissociates uh, iron into protons, neutrons, and electrons. Uh, so so the, um, the temperature is high enough to unbind uh, the, the most tightly uh, bound uh, nucleus, which is iron. And so this, is, uh, this costs a lot of energy. And then, uh, unfortunately, the, those protons, neutrons, and electrons uh, uh, have a, a reaction which uh, produce, which, uh, uh, which makes charged particles to, to disappear and have only neutral particles. So you have a, an electron captured on a proton produces a neutron and a neutrino. And so this is how you, uh, little by little, you form this neutron star. At the beginning, you had iron. Here, you had all sorts of... Uh, uh, particles, and now you have in the middle uh, mainly neutrons. And all those neutrinos which are produced here, and all the neutrinos which are inside these uh, proton neutron stars, are able to escape uh, apart this very inner uh, region here inside the proton neutron star where the neutrinos take uh, a fraction of a second to diffuse out. Um, as soon as they reach this blue region, they are able to propagate and take away the energy of the collapse. So you had, you had gravitational energy converted into kinetic energy. Here, kinetic energy is transformed into thermal energy. And here, thermal energy uh, is uh, taken away by a very efficient cooling reaction, is uh, neutrino cooling. cooling uh, neutrino take away this, uh, this energy. So you, you had, at the beginning, enough energy to make a nice bounce. But at the end, uh, all the energy is lost in neutrinos. I mean, 90. 90% of the energy is lost in neutrinos. Inside the neutron, the proto-neutron star, are, is the, the, the flux of neutrinos um, large enough to, to have them scatter off each other? I mean, is there neutrino, neutrino scattering? Can, yes, can uh, you repeat the question? The question is whether there are uh, reactions of neutrino, neutrino scattering inside the proto-neutron star. So there are uh, uh, all sorts of reactions. I mean. On my side, I, I make simplified models, so I don't need to consider neutrino, neutrino uh, scattering. But uh, the people who uh, develop uh, uh, advanced models, as, as I'm going to show on the next slide, really take care of uh, uh, taking into account all possible uh, interactions. So I, I'm not able to tell you what's the importance of this uh, neutrino, neutrino uh, scattering. I would. I wouldn't uh, claim it's a big uh, effect, but uh, when in the very, I don't have the slide here, but there's a very long list of all possible scattering reactions involving neutrinos, and, um, and uh, I guess it's among, among them. Yeah. <coughs> so in, in, this, uh, in, this, um, in this picture, uh, it, so it takes a fraction of, of a second for the neutrino to be absorbed, and the hope of this scenario is that let's say 10% of those neutrinos are absorbed in this blue region, which is dense enough to still absorb a little bit, uh, absorbed in this blue region, and uh, deposit uh, enough uh, energy uh, to heat up this blue region and push the shock uh, into an explosion. So the, the, it's really some leftovers of the, of the neutrino uh, flux, which in principle should be able should be enough to generate the explosion and uh, power this shock uh, up, to the, up to the surface of the star. You have to re remember that here we are so deep in the gravitational potential, remember one-tenth of the speed of light, that uh, if you manage to get out of this very deep region, then propagating to the very shallow uh, regions of the potential in the very external regions will be very easy. So the main difficulty is to get out of this, uh, of this uh, deep uh, potential well. So um, the, the most advanced numerical simulations by my, my colleagues in, uh, in Germany look like that in 3D. So these are uh, a huge, uh, this is a huge computational cost where you see in, in, in yellow the, the accretion shock um, of the, 
uh, of the matter falling towards the center. So in black, it's not empty. You have uh, matter flowing towards the center. This is the accretion shock, which is now showing some bubbling uh, activity. And on top of this bubbling activity, you have this large scale uh, sideways motion of the, of the shock. And at the center, you have this uh, white sphere, which is the surface of the proton neutron star. So the, what you've just seen here lasts uh, about uh, 300 milliseconds. <coughs> so each oscillation, each oscillation of the, each, each large scale oscillation which you see <coughs> is about uh, 30 uh, milliseconds. And this is uh, in, sorry, I should have said in, in diameter here it's uh, about 300 kilometers. So we are still dealing with this very, very small region. So, and all the, all the difficulty here is uh, to convince this, uh, <laughs> this shock to start moving outward. Um, and, we, and so what you saw here is uh, how, um, how important the deviations from spherical symmetry are. And there are two types. Uh, so those two types of deviations are due to two instabilities. One is familiar to most of you, I mean, to, I guess, to everybody. It's simply uh, convection. So you have in, the, in this, uh, here you have a, a view of the accretion shock during the, the phase we saw in the movie. And you have bubbles of uh, material which have absorbed uh, sufficient, uh, enough neutrinos to be hotter. So those bubbles try to rise against gravity in the same way as hot air would try to, to rise against gravity. Uh, so this is just, it's called neutrino-driven convection. So those are bubbles heated up by uh, neutrinos. And on, on top of this uh, small scale motion, you have a large scale motion, which, which was not familiar to anyone on Earth uh, before it was discovered in these simulations. And uh, it's called the standing accretion shock instability. It's responsible for a large scale displacement of the shock. And luckily, it's this uh, unfamiliar phenomenon which uh, is taking place in this uh, fountain uh, uh, which we're going to look at. So the, I'm not going to go into detail, but the, so I, I explained that the, the, those convective motions are due to buoyancy, this is natural convection, whereas here it's some interaction, the, the, the mechanism of this uh, standing accretion shock instability is due to the interaction of acoustic waves and vortices. Uh, so acoustic waves are able to generate vortices as they reach the shock. Vortices are able to make some, to produce some sound as they are traveling towards the neutron star. Uh, so it's, uh, it's called the advective acoustic uh, uh, mechanism. It, uh, it's not, not familiar in astrophysics, but it's, it's, it was familiar to people uh, drinking tea. <laughs> <coughs> because when you look at the, the kettle, the, the whistle of a kettle, uh, you, you have this cylinder here, which is uh, represented here. So actually you have two rings at the entrance and the exit of this cylinder. And as the gas, as the uh, uh, water vapor flows, against, uh, flows across this uh, cylinder, um, it generates a shear layer of uh, vortices, and as these vortices have to pass through the, the exit ring, uh, it's not easy for a, a vortex to go across uh, uh, this uh, ring, so it generates some pressure feedback and going outwards and inwards. And the pressure feedback going inwards is going to, to um, trigger uh, the formation of new vortices with a phase relation setting the frequency of those vortices. So this, is, uh, this kind of instability is responsible for the whistle uh, which you hear in the, in the kettle. So here you have an example of coupling between acoustic perturbations and uh, vorticity perturbations. And this is well known in, uh, by the people who study uh, the vibrations in the, in the engine of uh, rockets like uh, Ariane 5 where you have a similar problem of coupling between a, a vorticity and acoustic wave, which is responsible for a kind of a, a low frequency uh, vibration, which you want to, to avoid. And, and also, uh, you, people studying rockets uh, or, um, 
uh, are familiar with uh, a similar process involving not, uh, this time it's not uh, vortices, but it's entropy blobs. Uh, you can imagine fuel which is not properly burnt uh, will uh, travel uh, uh, down the, the nozzle and as it passes through the nozzle it also generates some feedback, a feedback loop between acoustic waves and the entropy perturbation. So this is, from the point of view of physics, this had been studied uh, in detail but it had never been considered in, in astrophysics. And now let's now translate all of this into the water uh, fountain. So the water fountain is, is based on this analogy between uh, uh, hydraulic jumps and, and shock waves. So the, uh, here you have, uh, I guess you recognize what's happening when you pour water in a kitchen sink. You have this transition between a, a shallow layer and a, and a deeper layer, which makes this beautiful circle in your kitchen sink. And this, this transition is really the analog uh, of, a, of a shock wave. Uh, it's, a, it's a point when, where the flow is trying to, to decelerate. So at, at this point, the flow was faster than the waves. It's the equivalent of being supersonic. Supersonic is faster than the speed of sound. Here you are faster than the speed of the surface gravity waves. And to decelerate to subsonic velocity, the equivalent of subsonic velocity, you cannot do that in a smooth manner. You always do that through a, through a discontinuity. And this is what your kitchen sink is telling you. If, I mean, you need to listen to your kitchen sink. <laughs> <laughs> And, and so if you now think of the collapse to the, black hole, to the neutron star, uh, you want to reverse this, uh, this kind of flow. So you inject water from the outside towards the center at, at a supersonic velocity, I mean in the sense faster than the waves. And, uh, and then you generate this, uh, this discontinuity, which is the equivalent of an accretion shock. And here it's what you would have expected if this accretion shock was stable. So it's just the beginning of the experiment. And, uh, and, and, uh, and to mimic the neutron star, as I said at the beginning, you have this cylinder in the middle, which is an obstacle to the flow of water. And since you cannot neutronize water to let it settle on the surface of this cylinder, you just get rid of water by letting it, uh, by letting it um, spill over the edge of this uh, hollow cylinder. So you have this, uh, this uh, analogy between uh, even a mathematical analogy between the propagation of acoustic wave in a gas, acoustic waves in a gas, and surface gravity waves in uh, shallow water. So any any change of, of den density and pressure in a gas is going to be represented here as a change in in a surface uh, uh, on, on the height of the free surface, so a change of, of depth. So this is the most. Uh, uh, encouraging part for uh, students, for your students, is the fact that this fountain was built uh, with very simple tools uh, in May 2010 in my garden. Uh, and uh, so I just wanted to try uh, having this uh, inflow of water. So the difficulty was to have uh, a uniform injection of water. So I started with a few uh, pipes and then more of them. And then, uh, and then in a few months, I, I, I had this uh, design of an uh, injection slit, which you saw at the beginning. And the results were so uh, resembling, resembling, so much resembling the results of astrophysical simulations that this experiment the, uh, made the cover of uh, physical review letters in 2012. Uh, after, of course, comparing its results to numerical simulations in a careful manner, because when you do experiments, as you know, sometimes you get uh, artifacts or... Yeah. So here we checked things carefully. And then uh, my institute in, in France, CIA, uh, built for me uh, 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 a new experiment much, uh, with much better uh, quality than this one, which uh, was used by the... Uh, Science Museum in Paris uh, to teach astrophysics to, uh, to the public. And uh, they, they also built another experiment, which I'm going to show you now, which uh, is a, a bit more uh, advanced because it's able to rotate and incorporate the angular momentum of the collapsing star. And I should say that we are now building another one, uh, <laughs> which is um, 
which is now 3 meter 50 in diameter with my colleague Gilles Durand uh, and uh, to, to, to have a, high, a bigger scale, so uh, um, smaller, smaller effects of, um, of viscosity. So when you look at it uh, from the top, this is the development of the instability in the experiment, and this is the development of the instability in a gas simulation, uh, astrophysics gas simulation, where you see you start from an oscillation and then you, you develop this uh, rotating motion. And, and this is a simulation of the experiment. So this is the uh, simulation of, of water. And so you see that the simulation of the experiment confirms that uh, the, what's happening in the, in the experiment is what is expected from those uh, equations. And, uh, and the resemblance between the, the, the different uh, simulations is, is striking. So the, now if you look at this, the first movie which I showed you, uh, now, but now I start really from the beginning, so I inject water. You see that first there are bubbles in water, so now you see this, uh, this uh, very thin layer containing bubbles. And at the beginning, the hydraulic jump is uh, more or less circular, it's a little bit turbulent. There is this object in the middle which uh, is just here to follow, the, to track the, the velocity of the inner uh, regions. And you'll, you'll see that as a flag, uh, this hydraulic jump doesn't manage to stay steady, so it starts uh, oscillating, and uh, as, as it reaches uh, nonlinear amplitudes, I mean larger amplitudes, it's going to switch to a, oscillator, to a rotating motion uh, in, a, in some random direction. So here it's going to rotate to the right, and you're going to see that as it rotates to the right, the inner regions of the flow uh, rotate in, in the opposite direction. And this is really the uh, consequence of uh, conservation of angular momentum. If you, since there was no angular momentum in the flow, uh, uh, in the incoming flow, uh, if you have created some rotating motion somewhere, it, you must have created the opposite motion uh, somewhere else. <laughs> so here you have a, a f first illustration of the fact that you can you can uh, spin up a neutron star uh, from a star which was not rotating at all. Uh, a non-rotating star can give birth to a, uh, a rotating neutron star. Now, if the fountain rotates, so you see a very slow motion of the fountain at the, uh, the outer edge here. Uh, the, you can demonstrate, it's not a, a trivial thing, but you can demonstrate that the, the instability is going to always rotate in the same direction as the fountain, so the, this oscillate, uh, oscillation of the, of the hydraulic jump is, is preferentially transforming into a, a rotating motion in the same direction as the fountain. And the inner region of the flow, which initially uh, rotated in the same direction as the, uh, as the injected flow, are, are now trying to resist, uh, to resist the, the uh, the rotation of the hydraulic jump, exactly for the same reason as before, because there is now more angular momentum contained in this uh, hydraulic jump, so the opposite angular momentum is falling towards the center, and now it's, uh, this uh, rotating motion has to resist against the, the incoming uh, accretion flow, but for this particular uh, rotation rate, you see that through a kind of stochastic motion, this uh, inner region of the flow is able to resist, uh, to resist the, the rotation of the, of the progenitor. Yes? Real quick, the inflow of water matches the outflow, so we're not accumulating any Yeah, no, no, because this, actually this boundary condition at the middle, at the center, uh, is a kind of self-regulatory, it, it will always allow f uh, water to flow out. So here you have a, an illustration of the fact that a rotating star can give birth to a counter-rotating pulsar, which is uh, quite uh, non-intuitive, but it's a simple um, illustration. And now, of course, if you have a device which is able to rotate, you, you like to see it rotating faster. And, uh, <laughs> and this, is, this was a big surprise because when you rotate it faster, so here you see the rotation rate here is faster, clearly, you, you discover a new instability which was not at all expected. So it's one of the 
benefits of this experimental approach is that it revealed uh, an instability which had been uh, found in some numerical simulations and which uh, is actually important uh, uh, for gravitational waves because the, this instability is, is, is has a, follows a different mechanism related to differential rotation. The fact that you have uh, a strong shear motion, the inner region rotates much faster by, I mean, to first order, angular momentum is conserved. So when you inject water with a certain rotation rate, it, it spins up like one over R square, simply due to the conservation of angular momentum. And then on, on top of this very differentially rotating flow, there is this spiral arm which develops and which redistributes the angular momentum. And this, in the interior of, uh, interior of a differentially rotating neutron star, so I'm, I'm talking of an isolated neutron star here, if you have such a differential rotation, this instability is very efficient at emitting gravitational waves. <coughs> And so here it's a slightly different context because we are accreting matter from the outside, but still this instability is able to, to develop. And of course you, you want to see faster rotation. So if you rotate faster, you don't even need a neutron star in the middle. So it's accretion on a black hole here. And the centrifugal force is enough to produce a shock you don't need an obstacle. So the centrifugal force is itself is enough to produce a shock. And this shock is, uh, again, unstable to some large-scale deformation, um, which uh, try to redistribute uh, angular momentum. So this what I show you just, uh, I show you this just for the sake of uh, curiosity. But uh, it's quite amazing that this simple experiment with water shows this range of, uh, of uh, dynamical uh, behavior. So I'm going to finish by showing you the connection to uh, gravitational waves uh, before my conclusion slide. So when you have such uh, asymmetric motion inside the, uh, the very dense and very massive regions, we are talking of the vicinity of the neutron star, uh, you, you can measure, so some, some people have estimated uh, the kind of uh, uh, gravitational waves which should be detected. And, and you saw the complexity of uh, various instabilities. I have, not, I have simplified the, the problem here. I, I have not talked about this convective uh, buoyancy-related motion. So you have different phases. You also have a phase of prompt convection, uh, which can be inside the neutron star. You have this SASI instability. And after the explosion, you have also, the, depending on the shape of the explosion, you have a signal which can go up or down, depending of the whether the shape of the explosion is prolate or, 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 or oblate. So it's more complex uh, than, uh, than binary black holes. Uh, but still, people hope by comparing the, the gravitational uh, waves uh, uh, for different uh, types of, uh, for example, here, different type of equation of state, because there, there are some uncertainties about the, the, the nature of the equation of state of dense matter inside the neutron star. You could have you could have preferentially uh, this uh, in this for example this signal would be the signature of the SASI instability for a soft equation of state, where, while uh, a stiffer equation of state would not show this this kind of instability. Whereas this this line here in both cases is the excitation of gravity modes inside the, the neutron star. So I don't want to to go in the details of those uh, this complexity because at the moment people try to. To, to establish uh, uh, reliable signatures that people uh, in LIGO will be able to recognize if, if, if such event uh, takes place in the galaxy. We have to know that those amplitudes are so small that only if a supernova explodes inside our galaxy, the, we, we, we will be able to detect them. No. Is, is there any relationship between the direction of the rotation and the rotation, and what happens in our atmosphere, cyclones. And yeah. So here, the time scale of the this experiment, as you saw, is about three seconds. So it's a very short time scale in the experiment. Uh, whereas uh, the Earth rotation is uh, is 24 hours. So the the effect is really 
uh, negligible for this uh, particular experiment. For, for cyclones, the, the motion of clouds is on much slower time scales than three seconds, so that's why it can be influenced by the, by the Earth rotation. But for such process, it's, uh, no, it doesn't, uh, I mean, I tried to see <laughs> if there was a preference, but um, I, I mean, the experiment is influenced by many other, other effects which are much more, um, much stronger than, than Earth rotation. Okay, so I, w I leave you with my, my conclusions. Uh, I hope, uh, yes, I, I would like to, to summarize the fact that uh, having a non axisymmetric I mean, having a non-uniform distribution of matter around the neutron star, when you have a region here which can absorb more neutrinos than when you had uh, 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 circular distribution. So this will help the explosion, having one region which is able to absorb more neutrinos, and this, is, this can be a trigger for a neutrino-driven explosion. So this explains why uh, the, such uh, instabilities are uh, are favorable to, to solve the mystery of, of supernova explosions, but having this asymmetric distribution is also a, a natural explanation for the kick of pulsars, because as, as matter is ejected in this direction by linear momentum conservation, the pulsar is going to be kicked in the, in the opposite direction. And also for the spin, we mentioned the conservation of angular momentum, which uh, in, implies some uh, spin properties of the neutron star. I'll take uh, your questions now. Let's thank, thank Terry first. <laughs> so uh, before the shuttle leaves at 5.30, we have time for questions. Uh, raise your hand, and I'll come over with the microphone. Ah, OK, there's some back there. Oh, you got it. Okay. Yes, you mentioned that the neutron star could be rotating in a different direction than the parent. Have, have these been observed? Or direct observations, or only uh, simulation? So there, are, there is a binary uh, a system of neutron stars where, indeed, one uh, neutron star rotates in the along an axis which is uh, like this compared to the other. So it's uh, it's opposite and also not aligned. I don't claim that this is the only explanation for that, but yes, yeah, it exists. Yeah. In the, in the fountain simulation, um, how important is the viscosity of the water, and is there an analog to the uh, iron core that would relate to that? Yeah, that's a, an excellent question. So, um, the, the viscosity of water is indeed uh, stronger than what you would like, um, but it's, it's strong. The strong effect of uh, the viscosity of water. Uh, is uh, ahead of the hydraulic jump, is in this region, which is very uh, shallow. And so you have a viscous drag. Uh, the main effect of viscosity is a viscous drag, which slows down the flow ahead of the... But since the dynamics of the instability is ruled by the uh, deeper region, it's not uh, a problem. But we take into account, when we compare this to numerical models, we take into account a, a viscous drag here, uh, without free parameters. So we just take a laminar from viscous drag, which, uh, which doesn't involve a free parameter. And then you have the transition to turbulence. You notice that the flow can be turbulent. And this, uh, I mean, in the, the Reynolds number associated to this turbulence happens to be comparable to the, ex to the expected uh, Reynolds number in uh, the stellar case due, um, due to neutrinos. Neutrinos are um, uh, responsible for a, a, diff a diffusion of uh, uh, linear momentum. They carry linear momentum, and, and in the vicinity of the neutron star, there is a Reynolds number of the order of 1,000, uh, which, which happens to be by chance comparable to the one we have in this particular experiment. But this, this is true only very close to the neutron star, and the neutrino effects in this region shouldn't be uh, as strong. So I don't claim that this is... Uh, uh, I mean, I, I, I would prefer to have a larger experiment with less, uh, uh, with less uh, viscous effects. But the good thing with the numerical simulations is that you can really estimate, you, in, the, in the numerical simulation of the experiment, you can switch off the viscosity of, uh, of water, you can choose whatever you like, and then you can estimate whether this is a strong effect or not, and it, usually it's not a very strong effect. Um, 
I've got the next question, I guess. Uh, uh, it's really great to hear the specifics of what happens with, uh, you know, white dwarf star that's secreting material and, and then the details of exactly what uh, occurs. Um, but I don't hear much about what happens if a neutron star has, is a binary companion and is siphoning material and it exceeds like three solar masses. Does it uh, supernova into a black hole? I don't, I don't really hear. No, no, the, if, the su if the neutron star exceeds uh, the uh, Tolman-Oppenheimer-Volkov uh, uh, limit, so uh, which which what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> there is a limit. I said, we, I said there is a limit for white dwarfs or for the iron core due to uh, the uh, degeneracy pressure of uh, relativistic electrons. This is 1.4 solar masses. But there is another limit for uh, a group of neutrons uh, resisting gravity through the uh, strong interaction between neutrons. There is a limit. Uh, due to general relativity, which is somewhere between two, uh, two and three solar masses. We don't know exactly. And uh, at this point, the neutron star collapses to a black hole, and this is not expected to produce... Uh, uh, so it's not an exothermic reaction, it's a... It's no, it's not, no. Yeah, I have never seen any any effect, any external effect. Uh, usually, it's just uh, it's for me. It's like I in my experiment, if I suddenly uh, push down the cylinder, uh, so there is no longer uh, a hard surface, then all, everything uh, will be absorbed in the middle. So this, this is the intuition I get from this experiment, and I have and from numerical simulations, I have never seen any. Uh, no, it does not exclude that some complex uh, effect of uh, particle physics would lead some to, to, to some something more complex than this <laughs> what's our experiment, but I don't know of such example. Yeah. Uh, hold on a second. Uh, two quick questions. One, on a neutron star, you talked about it having a, a, an electric current or a conductivity, which to me meant moving charges, but yes, they're neutral. Charges, yeah. Yeah. That was one, if you could address that. Yeah. And then the, and now I can't find what my other one was. <laughs> <laughs> there was a neutron star is uh, dominantly made of neutrons, but there is still a fraction of electrons. There is, there is, uh, yeah. so you, you have a magnetosphere around the uh, pulsars and a very strong, mag this is also one of the, of the amazing thing of the, those objects. You have pulsars which have 10 to the 12 Gauss magnetic fields, and then you have magnetars, which have 10 to the 14 Gauss magnetic fields. These are considered to be the, the engine of uh, uh, superluminous supernovae. So you have a, a, a whole range of exotic phenomena associated to the strength of the magnetic fields of, of uh, neutron stars or magnetars. Uh, but yeah, there are charges. And, and, uh, and the, as I said, the interior can be... Uh, uh, Super fluid can be uh, super conductive, so it's very, very, a very rich uh, laboratory for for physics. Yeah. So, so the the matter in a neutron star should be called neutron rich, rather yeah, than neutron purely rich. neutrons, yeah. because presumably there's an electron gas and a proton gas. Yeah, yeah, but it's I think it's neutron very rich, very rich. <laughs> okay, uh, another Sorry, question. I of the other question. Yeah, yeah, you know, here we have plenty of time. Uh, we understood why there was a frequency for rotating black holes or neutron stars. Where are you getting the frequency from an X? Yeah. The frequency for? For the instability? This. Yeah. Not the instability, but the frequency of the gravity wave. Yeah. Yeah. So the frequency of the gravity wave would be uh, twice the frequency of the, okay. of the pattern you see. And the frequency of the pattern of the rotation here or the oscillation is more or less given, defined by the advection time, how much time it takes uh, for uh, matter to go from the shock to the neutron star. This is what sets, I, I talked about this cycle between vortices and acoustic feedback. The acoustic feedback is fast, vortices are traveling at the speed of the flow. So the, the dominant time scale is really the, the, this, the travel time of, of the flow from the shock to the neutron star, and this is about 30 milliseconds. Yeah. Question over here. I'm just um, curious as to what made you think of your garden hose experiment, because you know my students aren't. 
I'm trying to encourage them to be more creative. Yes. And that's yes. like the spur of science. So where, what drew you to say, I'm going to see yes. if water I, I, and behaves. It's a very, it's a very important uh, point for me on which I always insist when I show this to the, the public. Um, people should, I, maybe I didn't say that the, the cost of this experiment was very uh, affordable. I mean, the, these uh, five different experiments in total were, uh, cost uh, 1,000 euros. So it was something I, I could afford. And, uh, and uh, so what made me think of it is that um, from the textbooks, you, you learn that waves in water, in shallow water, behave as acoustic waves. And, uh, and actually, my, my work before this experiment had focused on trying to understand why we should expect or not this, what was the mechanism. So this, uh, this, um, this coupling between uh, Bet this uh, little drawing here was really the work which uh, took me a lot of time. And, uh, and once I understood that there was not, nothing more than those ingredients, there is nothing more than acoustic waves and, uh, and uh, a shock and uh, vorticity perturbations to explain this uh, unstable dynamics, then it was clear to me that it was not specifically astrophysical and that I could reproduce this on Earth. And actually, I, I immediately thought of uh, uh, engines in, uh, in rockets uh, w involving shocks and uh, contacted uh, some friends who were working in this field and learned that indeed they had the kind of, uh, the kind of instability which, uh, which I showed uh, here. And, uh, and having those simple ingredients and the textbook showing that uh, you, you can mimic this with water, I, I was uh, uh, led to, to try it. I have a question. Uh, it's often said that a mountain on a neutron star, a mountain would be about a centimeter high on a neutron star, would also be a source of gravitational waves. Yeah. Would this funny pattern it help create mountains on the surface of a neutron yeah, star? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when I showed at the end the, the, the gravitational wave signature, uh, this, uh, this thing and the... And, and even uh, this line, I mean, here uh, you have the SASI instability, but this instability is al also contributes to feed. Uh, when I said, I, I briefly said, oh, this line is gravity modes of the, of the uh, neutron star. But what is a gravity mode? A gravity mode is a deformation of the, of the full structure of the neutron star, uh, which in a sense uh, uh, produces mountains on, on a large scale. So it's not a small scale mountain. It's a, it's more distributed uh, deformation, but it's really the same type of, mm -hmm. uh, of process, yes. No, I, I, get, I, I understand that I have, my question was a little different. If ah. the, imagine an actual mountain on a neutron star, ah. one centimeter high, let's say, or whatever a mountain yeah. height yeah. is. Wouldn't that interact with this other asymmetric, just the way you tidally lock? Yeah, of course, but then you have to explain why where, where the mountain comes from in the well, first place. It may have originally come from this instability, but wouldn't this be a self-sustaining... Uh, wouldn't the mountain get bigger no, for, or, uh, because of this funny asymmetric pattern? No? I mean, I think you need to explain first why is the mountain here, uh, there. Yeah. Uh, if it's uh, maintained by some process, then maybe the, the process will uh, get... Uh, well, I'm imagining the accretion also has the same asymmetry that you're showing, yeah. but that's no. not the case. No, and, and also one big difference with uh, the, the mountain on the neutron star is here we're dealing with a neutron star which is very hot, mm -hmm. which is so hot that it's, uh, uh, it can be 50 kilometers in diameter yes. and then slowly shrink to 10. And uh, so it's, it doesn't have a, a crust like a neutron star mm -hmm. where you could imagine uh, maybe the, the ah. mountain that you have in mind. It's more like a fluid... Uh, uh, so this, this is a proto-neutron star. It's a proto-neutron star. Proto -neutron which star. is different yeah. than a neutron yeah, star. Exactly. Yes, sure. exactly. Other questions? Yeah, one back uh, here. Yes. Uh, you mentioned that the um, uh, formation of elements heavier than silver is from colliding neutron stars. And so if you look at our own solar nebula to form our own solar system, what what is um, suggested to have happened in order to get the composition? Would we, how many s colliding neutron stars or, or other types of supernova were needed to generate yeah. the 2% heavy elements that we needed for our, you know, for uh, us? I, I don't know the number, 
but uh, it's the so I don't know how many uh, such uh, coalescences were necessary, but what I know is that the uh, the mixing by differential rotation in the galaxy is so is efficient enough to to get a uniform uh, abundance of uh, heavy elements, but I don't know the number of uh, events. Okay, more questions. We have time. Yes, Duncan. I have a, a quick response to my question, so I'm discussing exactly this. Ah, very good. So, so Chris Balchinski, who, Chris Balchinski, who chaired the last session, this is an active topic of research. So placing constraints on the neutron star merger rate from the abundance of our process elements. And the, the binary neutron star rate uh, in our galaxy is, is one every uh, 10 to the 5 years, right? So the, the rate of these neutron stars colliding in our galaxy is not high, but our galaxy is very old, so enough of these we think have, have collided to explain the, uh, uh, the, the our process elements. The, the, the platinum uh, and, and gold, these heavier elements have to be formed in these neutron-rich environments. But if you can find Chris Belchinski, if he's still around, he, he's just written a paper on this. So you said uh, 10 per million years? Yeah. And uh, one, one galactic uh, rotation is 200 uh, million years. So that's a, the number is big. <laughs> Other questions? <coughs> Just a naive follow-up. but All right, so you form these heavy elements. How do they leave the neutron star to go out into outer space and, and yeah, because actually when, when I was talking of this uh, uh, neutron-rich wind, actually in the, when you have a, a coalescing neutron stars, you have uh, tidal uh, streams, you have a lot of matter ejected from the, uh, from the coalescence. So uh, at the same time as the, the, the neutron star meet, you have uh, tides on the other side, which, uh, which let a lot of uh, material flow out. This is one thing, but also, uh, neutron stars are known, the, co the coalescing neutron stars are known to be uh, a source of, uh, gamma ray, of short gamma ray bursts. So while you have this motion with tides in the orbital plane, uh, you have also uh, some uh, uh, ejection of matter along the uh, axis of this uh, orbital plane and also in these uh, jets which give, uh, uh, which produce the, the short gamma ray bursts. Also, maybe there is there may be some R process. I'm not sure about where the R process is prefer preferentially taking place, but the geometry is, is not uh, 2D, but really uh, 3D. More questions? Yeah, hold on. So if you think, excuse me, but if you think of neutron stars are being one of the most interesting objects in the universe, then coalescing neutron stars as a source of uh, our process, I mean, heavy elements, and as a source of gamma ray bursts are really, really interesting. Yes, go ahead. Are images or videos of the fountain available for those of us who don't have access? The videos, uh, so the, everything will be uh, recorded here, and the, uh, some of the videos are already uh, some of the videos are already on the web. Uh, not all of them, but uh, if you ask me, I can give them to you. How, how, what would we Google to find the videos on the web? You type uh, supernova fountain. Supernova oh, my name fountain. Be my name. Okay. Supernova fountain. Okay, that's great. Yeah. Um, more questions. I have a question about the rotating experiment. What is rotating there? Is it the drain also, or is it just the outer jets? It's everything. It's the full, uh, full experiment. Um, the full experiment is rotating. So uh, the whole table. Basically. The whole table. So there is, there is some entrainment. You could mm -hmm. think that there is some entrainment by this surface, mm -hmm. but uh, that's very uh, negligible because as soon as the water uh, mm -hmm. enters, the, as I said, the, the angular velocity increases like one over R square. Yes. So the, the angular velocity of water is much faster than the entrainment. Actually, the, the, the fountain slows down the, the, the flow rather than entraining it, except at the outer edge uh, where the, the angular velocity of the water coincides with the velocity of the, of the fountain. Is that equivalent? What if I only rotated the drain apparatus? 
Like the this. train, you mean this, this yeah, part? Yeah, just that cylinder, I rotated no. something. Oh, it wouldn't do anything because this cylinder is... Uh, uh, wouldn't you have no slip on that cylinder? I mean, at, at the outer edge of the cylinder, but you have an incoming flow, so this would not propagate against the flow. No. Okay, yeah, a question over here. Hold on. Wait for the microphone. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> okay, go ahead. The water is going radially towards the drain? Yes. So now with, with this slight, with this slow rotation, there is a small uh, angular component. Uh, but if the, so, so uh, no, the, the answer is no when the, when the water, when the fountain rotates, in addition to the radial component, there is a v, uh, uh, v theta scaling like 1 over r to conserve um, angular momentum. So omega are like 1 over r squared. And, and if you, suppose you had uh, superfluid and did the same thing. That's what I, yeah, I wanted to do that at the beginning. But uh, if you do that, you lose all the simplicity of the experiment. <laughs> But yeah, I wanted to get rid of viscosity because the uh, astrophysical fluid, I mean, apart from this viscous neut neutrino viscosity, which I mentioned, uh, visc uh, astrophysical fluids are usually uh, inviscid in, in a good approximation. And uh, so I thought that, uh, and I, I thought it would be good, but if you want to make a super fluid experiment, then it, you need to make a small experiment, so otherwise it's too, too expensive, to, so you have to cool it down. It's, you, you lose all the, the beauty of the, <laughs> of the, all the simplicity of the problem. But I'd like to, to see the result, of course. I know some people have studied the kitchen sink uh, hydraulic jump uh, using a superfluid. They did that, that, that at the, in Paris, actually, at the Ecole Normale Supérieure. And they were a bit disappointed because they could not obtain a uniformly uh, superfluid uh, flow. So you had a superfluid on, on top, but the, you had a, at the bottom, you still had a moderately uh, viscous uh, flow. So yeah, doing this is not uh, an easy task, apparently. Yes. Does the, ah. so does the size of the drain affect us? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Very good uh, remark. Actually, the, the, pro the strength of this instability depends crucially on the ratio of the uh, shock radius, or hydraulic jump radius, divided by the drain radius. So yeah, there is a geometric factor, um, uh, which I, when I said that uh, advected vorticity generates some acoustic feedback, when I explained the mechanism, the, the amount of feedback that you generate depends how much you have squeezed the size of the, of the vortex. So the, the larger the, the, the ratio of the, those two scales, the stronger the instability. And this is true for the fountain, this is true for the astrophysical simulation. This is a very important parameter. Either you, if you want to have a stronger instability, either you shrink the neutron star, because it's a shrinking neutron star, which was 50 kilometers in radius and shrinking to 10. So uh, you can shrink it, shrink it faster, or you, you need to, to have an accretion shock, which is initially uh, larger. Uh, s some uh, geologists or geophysicists, they use a rheolitic uh, liquid. Have you tried that? Yes, I have. Yeah, this is one of the first things I, I wanted to do when I... Uh, what, what's a rheolitic liquid? <coughs> I don't think we know that what that is in general. It looks, uh, it, it looks like uh, you have silver particles inside of the, okay. of the liquid, Got it. And, yep. and as it changes density, you can see Great. changes. Okay. But it's the, the particles are elongated, yes. so they orient themselves <coughs> along the flow lines, and, and, uh, and there are some... Uh, Sometimes are, those are used in shampoo, so it makes some. Uh, you have some beautiful uh, uh, yes. Yes. flow lines in the shampoo, and uh, and uh, <laughs> but you see this in uh, in science museums. They use this a lot to show turbulence, for example. And uh, I used it, and I was very disappointed because th those particles uh, highlighted all the small scale. Uh, features of the flow, 
although I wanted to highlight the large scale uh, instability and they, they draw the attention to, for example, this. You see that the hydraulic jump here is a kind of double line here. You have the outer edge and then because it's a kind of roller, a horizontal roller. And so uh, a lot of this fluid will be captured in, the, in this second line here. So the, the, uh, the result was disappointing. Yeah. And then it was a mess to clean up the... <laughs> <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> yeah. Okay, I, I think uh, we should uh, end the session and end the conference. Uh, thanks everyone for coming. And okay. Thanks uh, uh, to Thierry and all the other speakers. Uh, so I hope you come again next year. Thanks for your feedback. Uh, we'll let you know which uh, date we're going to choose for the 2018 Teachers Conference. Have a good trip back. <laughs>